from here to there, from there to here. Funny things are everywhere. Didn't Dr. Su say that? Well, funny things at least are happening in China. For hundreds of years, those funny things have been well documented by comedians who do crosstalk. Crosstalk is a kind of comedy performed by two people on the stage going back and forth between each other, somewhat similar to the Abbott Costello style. Let's take a look. My phone. 手机买最好的手机，那也正常。来俩，俩，这屋一个，那屋放一个，怎么打呀？自个儿给自个儿打，怎么打？拨通了，喂，啊，放下往那屋跑，抓起来，喂，你好，你是谁？啊、再回来，我是郭德纲，跑回去，我也是郭德纲，这不是废话吗 ？This is Chinese cross talk or xiang xiang. It's the nation's most popular form of live comedy, and you can see it every year on Chinese TV's premier event, the Spring Festival Gala. It all started in 1983 when the first gala was hosted by CCTV. But five years later, in 1988, there was an unfamiliar face, a Westerner presenting Xiangsheng in Chinese. Kue Koryo from Yugoslavia was non-Chinese student of Chinese crosstalk master Ding Guangchuan. Since then, Ding has gained a reputation for teaching foreigners the art of Chinese crosstalk. More than 300 students from over 80 countries. In an early interview, Ding said he was trying to show the real China to the world. In the past, people from other countries tended to think Chinese are serious and cold. By introducing Xiangsheng abroad, I'm trying to make them know that China is also a nation with humor. His most famous student is Mark Roswell, known as Dashan. His comedy stylings have made him one of the most famous foreigners in China. He even had the honor of being the first non-Chinese to perform a crosstalk with Master Ding himself. Dashan, you don't know. Ah, now my English, ah, can you say so? Life in the everyday words for me is also no problem. Oh, oh, I'm going to learn a language. Ding really gets to know his students and may even consider him as much a friend as a teacher. Julian Gulfroy, now a well-known TV show host, is grateful for this connection. I like teacher Ding very much. He did so much for me, both in my learning and personal life. Although some Chinese may find the art form dated, it's a whole new world for Western learners. For them, it's a good way of learning Chinese. They think it's both theatrical and colloquial, with a lot of usable idioms and wordplay. This can still be a tricky business. They have to figure out what's really funny for Chinese audiences, a skill you can't really learn from a textbook. But while it may be challenging at first, Chinese-style humor is slowly transcending national boundaries and becoming more accessible to a wider audience than ever before. And now with me in the studio are two comedians who are not only foreign fans of Chinese crosstalk but also master of it after years of studying, living, and working in China. First of all, may I introduce Mr. Julian Godfroy? Is that pronunciation correct? It's absolutely well. My my family name was perfect. All right. You sounded like a French. All right then.、Uh, <laughs> he is a musician and a TV and radio show host here in China. Welcome. Well, thank you for having me here. It's great to have you, and also Mr. David Moser, a、mm -hmm. professor at Capital Normal University here in Beijing. He's bringing hundreds and thousands of American students to China. And study here every year. Yeah, I'm sure, but I don't do、uh, stand-up comedy in the classroom. <laughs> They don't think I'm very funny. No, but I have to tell you that he's a very good musician. He's a jazz pianist. In fact, he is a keyboard player.、Mm -hmm. We introduced、That's、at、true. the very beginning of our show. That's、yes. true. But I'm not funny anymore. So go ahead. <laughs> Talking about funny or not funny, stereotypes have it that the Chinese are always hilariously. Serious.、Oh, that, that's, a, that's a good concept. <laughs> well, it works. Yeah, yeah. It makes people laugh too, right? Yeah, yeah. I think that the Chinese have a great sense of humor. I don't know why、mm. people say that. I think that I think the, I think one of the reasons is that the Chinese have.、Uh, I think they have a great sense of humor, but they they also have a great sense of politeness and yeah, face.、Yes. And so they they are only they only permit themselves to be humorous in certain situations. Exactly. This is what I wanted to say: is that in everyday life you're going to feel.、Uh, and Chinese people love to have a laugh at everything. For that, I think a lot of、uh, cultures are like this.、Mm. But in China, you have a very precise notion of things you can say in everyday life, but you won't say in front of someone who's a. Special person,、right. or somebody you've never met, or if it's this type of stage or a TV station, when、uh, you become such a, you will give such an abstract concept. You have to give an example.、Uh, 
Well, I can uh, give an example. Okay, okay give, give, an example. give one. Give one. The other day, you know, I with some people, some some teachers, some some grade school teachers, and you know, mostly women, but they were about maybe 40, 50 years old, and they asked me a question. They said, uh, "So you only have one child, right? You just have one daughter?" And I said, "Well, yes, as far as I know." <laughs> and 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 the, and they didn't laugh. And they sort of went. What? What do you mean? As far as you know, I mean that's. And, and then one of them said, "Oh, he's making a joke. Like he might have some other." They said, okay. It's it's sometimes a conflict of generation. You, you, yeah, you need also. to have a cultural interpreter from yeah, time to just, time. But I think but, this was not the kind of joke that someone would have made in that situation. In that that's situation, the that's, that's the thing. The and and maybe with younger people who are more used to have fun at everything, maybe it would uh, go better. But what what I meant too is that some jokes, let's say, we are very uh, we know each other very well, and and we're gonna you know. Uh, go at it for you know. I'm yeah. gonna uh, make fun make of you. As, and there's some form of sarcasm that I wouldn't say on a stage or a TV show because mm. then the audience thinks that he's laughing, but he's actually feeling very embarrassed. And that uh, Julian, you shouldn't be saying anything like that. You make yeah. and he's actually not embarrassed. But you're talking are about modern like China, that. obviously the two right. of you. No, no, but, the, the but, China we but know. But both of you have learned Xiangsheng. Yes. Mm -hmm. So actually, the Chinese humor has been going through quite some history. So what does the kind of humor presented in the Chinese Xiangsheng. You've been learning that for 20 years almost, mm -hmm. some of you. Yeah. What is it like, the Chinese humor inside the Chinese Xiangsheng? Uh, David? Uh, well, you have to sort of make a separation because there's traditional Xiangsheng that was uh, before 1949, going maybe from the Qing Dynasty yes. through the 20th century. And those are these traditional pieces that had that were performed in the tea houses and everything. Mm. Then after 1949 and then up to the 1980s, it became a different kind of form because it, because of TV. Jiangshui is still a very very distant thing. It is distant already in Chinese history. So maybe David, I know you've been doing yeah. a. Doctor's thesis about uh, specifically Xiangsheng. Master thesis. Yeah. What exactly is it about? Well, Xiangsheng was um, originally. Uh, it, it's it's going to take too long to explain it all, but it was basically a kind of street theater, a, a dialogue between two people, um, and it was meant to to be sort of very much uh, pop, a popular form that talked about you know lo, uh, problem daily life problems and stuff like that, and. Uh, I think the, the the thing Western audiences might be most familiar with is the Abbott and Costello routine that you mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. who, who's on first. It's a kind of a set routine that, that involves uh, you know a certain kind of set of jokes, and m most people are familiar with it. And these are the traditional pieces, mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, those kind of reflect the older China. And so, but a lot of the humor could be very body and sort of. Uh, Mm, uh, risque, even, and, and and it was very earthy. Let's put yes. it that way. They, I, I think even after forty nine, they dared to make fun of more of society problems than they used uh, to before. And uh, before forty nine, it was more you know going at each other. You yeah. know, I make fun of you, you right. make fun of me, or even there was this old routine that says it's always the dogen who makes fun of the pungen, who's more the personal. one who's uh, talking less and doing mm, all okay or asking questions. Just a funny man and a straight man. Right? And if, mm -hmm. yeah, and, and uh, it, I think now it's it's also totally uh, a different story now because people have more influences. But uh, to answer your question differently. Uh, with Xiangsheng, it's usually on stage and for many people. So you, you do a type of humor that is not really humor. That is a way to make people laugh. And you use techniques that are different than saying a funny thing in everyday life. Do you still remember the first piece of Xiangsheng you learned? And wow. how funny was it? Can you explain to our viewers maybe just a very small short paragraph of it that's where the yeah. joke comes I from. Can, I can remember one of the first ones. I think the first one Next is you, uh, Julian. Um, <laughs> it, it was, it's a tr traditional piece called Zhang uh, Xiaozui. And the, the point being that, that Chinese traditional female beauty, there's supposed to be this small cherry lip mouth, you know, that's but right. some women who have big mouths and they, big lips <laughs> and big lips they feel like they're ugly and so so the, the joke is that that he said he knew this woman in order to make her mouth look beautiful whatever you ask her she would not answer in a that using words that would open your mouth wide okay. right so if, if if you ask her how old she was she wouldn't say i'm 28 she'd say i'm 22 you know yeah. this <laughs> kind of thing even the content changed right so so that was the joke and so i did this joke but i added something and i did this at peking university with one of my professors and uh i brought along some lipstick and i put on some lipstick but, which is but, not but the just part yeah, of just your mouth little, it's just uh, the middle of it lip. yes <laughs> and I did this, and the crowd just fell on the floor laughing because they'd never seen a performer 
do this, you know, put the lipstick so on. So the funny part wasn't actually what you, what you were saying, it was the lipstick. It was partly the lipstick. Yeah. You were, you were, uh, but, but that's an example of a traditional piece. You get the idea and, and, you, and you can play it out as long as you want. Mm. That's also a social phenomenon yes, which the right. piece have been playing with. And what about you, Julian, the well, first piece? I, I, was not, I was not as lucky or as good as you the first time. I remember <clears throat> I memorized for a show, uh, it was after I met Mr. Ding, and um, I was actually still with living in your uh, shifu. Who, yeah. Yeah, who our was teacher, our teacher. Yeah. Teacher Ding, Ding, Lao, Ding Guangquan. Yeah, Ding Guangquan Lao Shi. And, and I was still living in Shanghai back then, but he introduced me to a show uh, that, was, um, uh, that I would be hosting with a, a Chinese female host for a, a competition for foreigners talking Chinese, something like that. I would host the thing, and they wanted me to perform something because they, you know, right. they asked Mr. And Ding. And your so piece is? The piece, I had, I, I memorized two pieces. One was the Bao Cai Ming, you know, just a word, the tongue, what, how do you say the it's tongue like strings? It's like a tongue twister tongue yeah, of tongue twister all the style. dishes' names. Yeah, or Zheng Yang Gao, Zheng Xiong Zhang, Zheng Lu, Ye Shi Hua Ya Shou, Zi Ge Lu, Zhu Lu Ya, Jiang Ji La Rou, Song Hua Xiang Lu, Ya Rou Xiang Chang, Shi Zin Song Hua. See, can do it, yeah. Yeah, I, I could do the whole These thing. These are like the basic skills you guys need to learn, right? Basic right, skills. Right, right. And, well, I memorized it, and then there was a Danko Xiangsheng, which was a real story. Which a one person form. One mm -hmm. person form, Monologue. and you tell a story, and you're supposed to make people laugh every two sentences or one sentence. And at the rehearsal, I did it for TV, and the, 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 <coughs> the word uh, twister went perfectly, and they, everyone was clapping, it was great. And when I was t telling the story that lasted for 10 minutes, no one laughed. Really, no wow. one laughed. Just, oh, no, one old lady was there, <laughs> but she was probably amazed at my Chinese. Did you invite her for dinner? I should have, yeah. I should have. How uh, did you react when nobody laughed? Well, you're embarrassed, but you don't have m uh, much experience, so you don't know what to think or... Uh, I, I didn't really overanalyze that, but I understood Mr. Ding was laughing and said, well, you see, you speak good, because uh, people were thinking, all those foreigners, they just speak Chinese and go on stage and, uh, and people think it's funny. And actually, I learned that all the other foreigners, I thought, only had to go on stage and right. be funny. It was actually also a skill. Humor <laughs> has a lot to do with perceptions and linguistic skills. So I really wonder, through this process of learning Chinese xiangsheng or crosstalk, what kind of new perceptions have you learned about this country or this culture and new linguistic skills that's really colloquial, that would really help you to be street smart here in China? Yeah, well, you know, I've, I've actually made some, some crosstalk uh, teaching materials to help people learn Chinese. And and, and your other guest on the show, Da Shan, you know, Mark is a good example of someone. Mark going who, to be with us later yeah, in the program. Yeah, he's someone who, whose Chinese got as good as it, as it is, partly from doing Xiangsheng a lot, right? But I, I think it, it, it makes you very aware of, of the, sort of, uh, the sort of important parts of the language, such as pronunciation. You're very uh, clear about uh, you know, standard Mandarin, Putonghua. It also has a lot of, to do with, with accents, regional accents, regional dialects. There's also a lot of idioms and a lot of things called the xie mm -hmm. yu, which is this traditional uh, allegorical two-part saying in Beijing dialect. So it's, it's great. It, Xiangsheng is a form that's, uh, that's very obsessed with language and linguistics. And, and almost, almost every piece has something that, that calls attention to the audience to the linguistic aspects of what they're saying. Mm. And there are lots of, because there's a lot of, uh, of knowledge in there. You have to, to memorize text of, uh, of history, for example, when you do that. And right. this is a great thing. Uh, with Xiangsheng is that you can learn a lot with, uh, about Chinese culture. You memorize also the Bao Cai Ming and then you know the, the names of 200 dishes just mm. like that by memorizing for, for, for one week. But you uh, guys also been embedded with the Xiangsheng circle, shall I say that, because your teacher is Mr. Ding Wangchuan and he's well known for bringing in these international students yes. and learn this Chinese traditional cultural format. Uh, but at the same time, you got to know many of those people inside the Xiangsheng circle. And these people are supposed to be quite grassroots and also street smart mm -hmm. yes. and very colloquial when it comes to language and the way they're doing things. But so what is that aspect of China that you've seen? How would you describe it? Were you taken by surprise or actually it's a beautiful, nice surprise? No, I think it's a good thing. I'm, I'm, I'm <coughs> say, there's also a danger here because there, there are lots of those foreigners and because we are, we were uh, type, kind of a phenomenon, right? The foreigners who would speak Chinese and, and make Chinese people laugh and do xiangsheng. 
But some of uh, us went a little too far by trying to sound too Beijing or trying to sound too Xiaosheng and using words that typically, typically uh, you don't hear in everyday life and you only hear in Xiangsheng uh, or a way of saying them, you know, with a typical Xiangsheng tone or, or... So this is a dangerous part too. So and the onstage stuff has become offstage and it becomes such a little bit yes, too much. Yes, you, 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 you become part of... But it's like, sing, you know, opera singers who... <laughs> who speak like that all the time. Right. So some people just have that. It's um, but I, you know, you, mean, you asked about the performers, and um, you know, one thing that's, that's interesting is that uh, they're, they're, it's a traditional art form, and it has its standard you know, uh, skills and routines and things like that. I think that there's one problem with the traditional performers, that they sometimes get very conservative in the way they do it, and, and they, they feel like, oh, this is, you can't add this kind of new element because that wouldn't be the traditional piece, or that wouldn't be the traditional crosstalk piece. And so uh, the reason that the Ding Wang Chan, our teacher, is so special is that he's someone who could take foreigners because he said, the tradition doesn't matter so much. Let's just try something new. Let's just do something <laughs> totally different. A lot of the other traditional performers, uh -huh. they're very good at what they do, but, but they're also very conservative about their art form. Let's and they wouldn't forget. let you make a mistake or let you try out something. So you're actually forget. quite fortunate to have Mr. Yes, Dean. Right, yeah, right. Let's not forget that the traditions we're trying to perpetuate or to, to, to imitate come from people who actually were innovators at the time. Yeah, of they course, were not. As with all traditions, mm -hmm. once it becomes set, then that becomes, if you, if you want to make it a museum piece, that's deadly. And times have changed. They wouldn't want us to, to do the right. way they did. And this is one thing I wanted to say earlier, is that there's one great thing with studying any form of comedy, not only Xiangsheng crosstalks, is that you have to make people from another culture laugh. So you have to learn more about their, their culture. And this is a great thing. You have to know how to speak or how to say something. Mm -hmm. And you learn skills also to Here, tell, even tell a joke on a... On a here's on the a, thing. I think one interesting phenomenon about the so-called foreigner speaking Chinese Xiangsheng or doing Chinese Xiangsheng is whether they themselves have become, quote unquote, the joke or actually the joke that they yes. are telling about have become the humorous part mm -hmm. to the audience. There's a huge difference between these two, and it has a lot to do with the perceptions of Chinese as time goes by. David, what do you think? Which part of it, and which part would you prefer? It's, a, it's such a special thing to have this foreigner there. You can't just pretend that it's an ordinary piece and just do it in the traditional way. You've got to do something. And, you know, and one of the things is you have to let the foreigner be the one who does the most talking, otherwise it doesn't really make mm -hmm. much sense, right? So I, I think that there was, you know, Julian can can agree with this or disagree, but I think there was there was a stage at which that the only joke, the only point was that it was a foreigner doing it. It didn't even matter what you said or how well yeah. you did it. It was just the novelty. You would Have say we gone through that yeah. period? Have we gone through that period? Yes, already? I was going to say. I think we've gone to another stage now, and it's no longer just uh, just uh, to, to see the foreigner up there as that it's a novelty act. You now have to actually do something that's actually artistic or actually groundbreaking or interesting, otherwise it's not funny. There, there are two aspects here. Uh, the first one is, as you were saying, are, are we actually telling the joke uh, or are we the joke? But the result is the same, is that people laughed. Then it's about analyzing why did people laugh and, mm. and, and you all have that, those recollections. Where Do you, you care as a comedian? Well, we have to care, but at the same time, the result is always the best. And, and you can always <laughs> pretend that it was a second degree. Uh, but, but, but there's, there's one other aspect. I, I, I watched a lot of, uh, of Western comedy as well, yeah. French and American. I remember one black comedian American saying, you know, you always have to remember who you are, which meant the perception others have of, of you. you. And look at American comedy. Still, I mean, it's a big melting pot. It's maybe the, the, the biggest in the world, but mm. still, most black comedians, they make black humor, right? Most Jewish comedians make Jewish humor. Most uh, Arab comedians, uh, they, they, they do. You know, everyone goes with their his, own niche. The, yeah, and or Indian guys like Russell Peters, right. they always have fun are with you, that. Are you, so. are you satisfied with that kind of description? You have to have your own niche, and maybe it's a very small niche? Well, I agree with what he's saying in that there is an audience stereotype, and you've got to at least acknowledge it. You've got to yeah. either go with it, you know, play along with it or violate it, but you, you, you can't deny that there is the stereotype, and that's right. our problem too. As and soon as we're up there on the stage, they say, oh, a foreigner. You cannot deny it because this is a the real perception of people, and if you want to make them laugh, you have to accept what right. they see in you, and, right. and this is why when Joe Wong went on stage and says, well, I'm Irish, all people were laughing. All right, and see? final question before we go. I think times are running past very fast. People talk about the future of Xiangsheng or Chinese crosstalk. There's always debate about the old and the new. Where is the future? Can anyone like you in this niche 
play a role for its future? David? I think the crosstalk has to evolve. It has changed. There's so much competition now. Mm. And unless the, I think the problem is in the performers have to have some, you know, some new ideas. And people are going into stand-up comedy, which you're going to talk about, I know. And, uh, and I think that that's, that's the main thing. The future, if anything, for Xiangsheng, it has to, it has to adapt and, and you know, do something new. I had this right. big discussion with Mr. Ding, and he was saying that Xiangsheng, he's more traditional. And, and I was saying, you know, for me, it has to adapt and it has to be comedy. He said, yes, but comedy is comedy. Xiangsheng is Xiangsheng. So Xiangsheng, yeah. it's, it's different views. Right. right. And, but Mr. Ding had a very nice point about this. Is there were maybe uh, in the 50s and 60s and then in the 80s, Xiangsheng was too famous, too big a thing. So it's not that it's in decline, but it's, it was too much at those times. Mm -hmm. And now right. it's come back to normal and we have too much media and other choices to make. I can tell you are a good student of Mr. Ding, but at the same time, <laughs> certainly wonderful learners of Chinese culture. And we are benefiting from your style of Xiangsheng as well in order to understand better about our own culture. Thank you so much for being with us and Happy New Year you to too. the two of you and your beloved ones, uh, Julian and also David. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Welcome back to Laugh Out Loud, the World Insights Chinese Lunar New Year special. From traditional Chinese crosstalk to Western style stand-up comedy, the Chinese these days have more choices when it comes to their entertainment. Many non-native Chinese speakers are entertaining Chinese audiences using Mandarin. It all started with Huang Xi, the Chinese-American who is so funny that a few years ago he was even invited to be the guest host of the White House Correspondent Dinner. My name is Jiu Wang, but to most people, I am known as Hu, <laughs> which is actually my mother's main name. One microphone Everybody. and mind for comedy. That's enough to bring you a belly laugh every time, just as Huang Xi did in the U.S. The video went viral in 2010, introducing Chinese to an unfamiliar form of entertainment, stand-up comedy. Huang, or Zhou Wong, is now back in China trying to promote Western comedy. His stand-up routine has become a fixture in Beijing talk show club, one of the nation's most renowned comedy groups. Beijing talk show club often performs at bars. By presenting American-style comedy in Chinese, Stand-up comedians are giving audience plenty of laugh-out-loud moments. Let's take a look. The stand-up comedians are from all works of life. Engineers, students, lawyers. But even the amateurs seem able to produce a steady stream of laughter. Some performers started performing in English at first. The bilingual feature is still a big part of the show, a crucial element for bridging the divide between Western and Eastern humor. <laughs> for many here, it was that first time watching live stand-up comedy. It's fair to say they liked what they saw. <laughs> Xi Jiangyue, founder of the Beijing Talk Show Club, is optimistic about the future of stand-up comedy in China. The numbers of both stand-up comedians and audience members are increasing. It will be more and more popular in China. Tony Chou, who performs in both English and Chinese, told me that some of his Western friends are even performing in Chinese these days like Das Bishop and Da Shan. This is their culture, but they're going to figure out how difficult it is to perform in a second language. Da Shan, or Mark Roswell, more famous for his Chinese crosstalk, is now giving stand-up comedy a shot. <laughs> Western style and Chinese content mother tongue or second language. In a modern China where the East meets West, stand-up comedy has a bright future. And with the pressures of modern life, who would say no to another chance to laugh? Shi Haizhen, CCTV, Beijing. 
Sitting with me here in the studio are two of the most well-known stand-up comedians in China who though originally came from a totally different culture have become big names in the Chinese comedy circuit. First of all, Da Shan, of course, his real name is Mark Rosewell. Not many people know that. Yeah. <laughs> Not many people know that. <laughs> Chinese people are more familiar with your Chinese name, of course, Da Shan, yeah. meaning big mountain. Big mountain. Wow, all right. And also Mr. Jesse Appel, yeah. who has become China's recently big name, stand-up comedy, and is an intercultural comedian yeah. we would like to describe you. Welcome sure. to both of you. First of all, how can you describe the current situation of Chinese cross uh, crosstalk and also probably more important, the stand-up comedy? What is it like? You want to start? <laughs> I, don't know. Sorry, big question. I think comedy comedy is always current. It Like they were just talking about how crosstalk has to evolve. I mean, we respect the traditions of crosstalk and everything, but the the content always has to be something that people can relate to. If I make jokes about something that happened in the Ming Dynasty, it doesn't make a lot of sense to people today, right? Mm -hmm. So the content always has to be relevant. And I think the same thing with stand-up. If we bring stand-up comedy to China and just tell jokes that are funny in America, well, that's not Chinese comedy, right? So uh, stand-up as well has to adjust to Chinese audiences, to, to the Chinese reality. So you don't and, think and it's translatable, Chinese. the jokes? And the humor. No, well, personally, I always avoid translation. I hate doing translation. I either work in English or I work in Chinese. I never go back and forth. It's two totally different logic, is that what you're saying? Oh, boy. It's two different audiences. I don't know if it's different logic. It's, it's, it's different cultural perceptions. Yeah, yeah I would say the, the biggest difference is the audience. Uh, I, you know, I do comedy in English and I do comedy in Chinese, and <clears throat> the, biggest difference is not <clears throat> the biggest difference is not how you go about telling the joke, it's who you're telling joke to. Right. See, he's much better than me because I would never do English comedy. It's, <laughs> it's too difficult. You I didn't wouldn't. say it was good. I didn't say it was good, but I've tried. Yeah. But yeah, when yeah. you are addressing these two audiences, what are the differences? Are there real differences? I think the sense of humor is actually universal. I don't really... People talk about a Chinese sense of humor and a Western sense of humor, but I find comedians never talk that way. Chinese comedians don't talk that way either. People that understand comedy realize that the sense of humor is the same, but the content... The cultural perceptions are different. Mm -hmm. Give me an example so that might be example. for a you know like an English-speaking audience, okay, but so not necessarily here, translatable. Here's Chinese. an example. For instance, the traditional crosstalk Wai Pi Sanguo, where we're talking about the the romance of the three kingdoms, right. which is a, a piece of traditional Chinese um, uh, literature, a classic mm -hmm. that everyone knows. And you take that story and you twist it or you have sort of a new interpretation of that story. Well, the problem is for a Western audience, you could translate that into English, but people don't know the work yeah. as they would know Shakespeare or something. So, right. But in English, we have the same, exactly the same type of humor. For instance, where you take, say, a story from the Bible or something from Shakespeare, a piece of literature that people know, Romeo and Juliet, and you twist it. Mm -hmm. If you don't know what the original version is, you don't understand the twist. Right, so that you have to have the cultural context, yeah. but in fact, the way of that that sense of humor and the technique of making something funny is identical. Yeah, mm -hmm. a lot of comedy comes from that reversal, so you need to know that the audience is going to be jumping off of that same baseline of culture uh, that you're that you're referencing. Although there will be sometimes there will be the thing that there will say like for instance there will be a story in Chinese culture and a story in Western culture that actually touch the same thing about us as people that makes us interested. Yeah. They'll have the same themes, they'll have the same ideas, and one story could be completely culturally Chinese, but you can draw a pretty close parallel to a mm. similar story in yeah. Western culture. Mm. Finding something that's reflective of the human experience, not yeah. necessarily a Western experience or a Chinese experience, but a human experience. Mm. That's where you find the commonality. When you are talking about the Western or the Chinese, uh, it seems to be one versus the other, not necessarily what you mean though. but. It really makes me interested whether you guys are playing with stereotypes. Are you playing with for stereotypes or are you playing with them against stereotypes? So, well, the, the stereotype, and this is, not, this is not necessarily a Chinese thing. I think, again, it's universal. The stereotype of the foreigner is always somebody who doesn't really understand. He doesn't speak the language. He's lost, you know, like Manuel in Faulty Towers. Yeah. So that's the, you, in Chinese we say like the Sha Lao Wei, right? The, yeah. He doesn't speak Chinese very well, he doesn't understand, he's like wide-eyed and naive and everything. Mm -hmm. And I think every culture has that stereotype of any other foreigner. You mm -hmm. come here, you, of don't, the otherness, you don't get it. In a yeah. way. And so the flip is always that in fact, 
It's the opposite of that. You notice yeah. that's that's what Joe Wong does in America. Mm -hmm. He looks like he's clued out and he's got mm -hmm. these big glasses and everything. He looks mm -hmm. like he doesn't know what he's talking about. And all of a sudden you realize, oh, he actually understands America better than most Americans. Yeah. But what about you? You seem to appear, at least in some of the stand-up comedy, street smart to so your Chinese audience. You try to play the Chinese jokes to the Chinese audience. Not necessarily come in as a foreigner anymore because because no, you're a big name for, yeah. for, 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 for 30 <laughs> well, years already in China. Why is that? Why do you have that courage to do it? So with me, it's a little bit different because people know me from television. He's talking they know about the, exceptionalness. Yeah. <laughs> they, they know the image, right? So I'm coming, I, anytime I come to a performance, it's coming with the image of Dash N that people know. So I'm not just the, I'm not just the foreigner, the Caucasian. I'm, I'm a specific character, Dash N. Yeah. And so instead of just playing with the stereotype, sometimes maybe you'll play with that <laughs> character. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I, I try very hard to avoid playing to the stereotypes because the whole point is I've had the opportunity to come to China. If I come to China, live here for several years, work at comedy, and the best I can come up with is making jokes about chopsticks or, you know, whatever whatever stereotype American people already hold, I really haven't been doing my job well. Mm -hmm. um, for us, that's just, that feels like failure. It's yeah, like, that, that's, that's all I, I can well, do. I'm, yeah, right. at, at I have point. to scan all your performance in order yeah. to know whether you really did <laughs> um, that or not. So <laughs> what I try to do, though, is, again, just like I'm not denying that I'm a foreigner when I go on right. stage in China, I'm not going to make be angry at the American audience that they don't understand China as mm. much as I wish they did. Um, that's part of why I'm going to do the show is to take this one step at a time. Okay, so, you have to talk about China, right? So you give me an mm -hmm. example as to how you talked about China in your stand-up comedy. You're creating this international character who's not like, you know, 大家好,我来自美国. I come on and say, yeah, 美国朋友. <laughs> um, I'm coming on and say, you know, 我是东北人. You know, I'm from the Northeast of my country. Manchuria. Uh, no, no, I'm way. from Dongbei, Dongbei. Dongbei. Oh, yeah. so I'm from the Northeast North of America. Too. Yeah. And so it gets people out of this perspective of saying like, oh yeah, other countries are going to have Northeast. Other countries are going to have accents. Oh wow. It really the only difference between you and me is that I just don't know the specifics about the R mm. and like where the Boston accent comes in. Right. But don't we always believe the other cultures have less diversity than our own? It seems to be a tendency, isn't it? You have to find a way to get out of that just pigeonholing, just that everything is defined by your country. And I find, um, I find in China actually Chinese people do that as well they, because Chinese have a, a very strong sense of collective identity. Mm -hmm. Sometimes Chinese people treat themselves as if their culture is homogenous, and it's really not. No. North, south, east, west, uh, different age groups, different education. No, we don't treat it as a, a homogeneous thing. Actually, we are joking about each other, right? Mm -hmm. But well, this is the thing, within themselves, Chinese people... It's okay, with, but what about like a quote-unquote outsider like you guys No, but I think about. with Chinese, when talking to foreigners, they present the face that it's homogenous. Yeah. Mm. So when the they're thing. talking with themselves, they'll talk about the difference between Beijing and Shanghai, but they're, when they're talking with foreigners, it's all of a sudden it becomes we Chinese. Yeah. And I keep thinking, well, which, which Chinese are you talking about yeah. now? And could that become an interesting part of your stand-up comedy? I think so. Anything. Play with I that? think yeah. Any I think is, these sure. are the sorts of things that like good stand up will have some sort of observation it's looking to say about the world. Uh, that might not necessarily be the joke, but as a performer, I'm always looking for these these thoughts, these uh, yeah. struggles, these mm. sounds, these experiences that happen to me as a person. And then when I go on stage and I talk about something that happens to me on the subway, yeah. uh, it's not a, you know, like foreigner on the subway joke because this happened to me in real life. And so you get over that bump by explaining things that actually have to do with people in their lives. The, the observations are really important. And, and often you'll have one observation and you'll just think it's a good idea but you're not quite sure how to do it. And then right. six months later, you'll yeah. have another observation and you'll realize, oh, there's the joke. Yeah. I got to put those two together and then that's a great joke. Sometimes it's even- very good memories as a result. And you have to have that f kind of mind that Click. thinks those yeah. things yeah. that, that, you, that normal people <clears throat> don't think. I think and it's you know, a lot sometimes of- sometimes yeah. biocultural make you a little <clears throat> bit confused also because something could, sounds familiar to you and you just cannot remember where yeah. it come from, which culture is it. But I'll let you speak, yeah. Jesse. It's not yeah. about interview about No, it. no, no, no. <laughs> I, I was just saying like on those observations, yeah. like this is ir ironically, being in a foreign country, I think makes you a better comedian because you see oh. everything mm. with fresh eyes. I think it was um, uh, Lao Shi. Yeah, also said that there was there's something about being a foreigner that makes you look at things with a comedic stance. But can you remember and because staying here or staying anywhere for two or three years, you get used to things and you st begin to lose sometimes those fresh eyes, as they yeah. say. Well, you lose you lose some of that, but you also gain new things. So 
I lose, I maybe lose a little bit of this like fresh eyed wonder of like, wow, everything is different. I'm overwhelmed. Mm. But I also gain the ability to dig deeper, which I didn't have before. Um, you know, I notice things now living here for a couple of years and speaking the language that I just did not notice like originally. What? Uh, you know, there'll be different things between, um, you know, social, uh, I'll try to think of an example. There, like when I first came here, the first things you'll see is like, oh, some of the signs are translated funny. Mm -hmm. um, but then when I understand the language, I know exactly how that translation happened, <laughs> yeah. which makes it even funnier like maybe, because I know exactly what they're trying to say and I know exactly where it went wrong. Because after a while exactly. in China, he doesn't read the English anymore. Yeah, yeah. So that's <laughs> but, also part of it. Yeah, but you know, for Jesse, it's a few years, but for you, it's like a few decades. Few decades. Oh, yeah. my God, yeah. you say that? oh my God. So, so what is like for you to do that culture? cultural comparison. Do you do that anymore still? So for me, I, I really try to base my comedy specifically on me. I tell jokes about myself, right? And, and my experiences. And those experiences are from someone my age, almost 50, and being in China for 26 years now. So I, I don't think I should be doing the youth humor, right? I should, I should, that's my special niche now is to do that uh, based on my own experience and, yeah. and, and find stuff there. This is also right. something that's special about stand-up is that you, as the comedian, your identity, your life experience yeah. is often what the whole routine is about. Right. You, as a proxy for other people like you who have gone through similar experiences, but often about you. And the way that I tell, because there's, there's a lot of comedy around China that people are uh, taking jokes from Weibo or taking jokes from the internet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the easiest way to figure it out is if they said that I did something, but it doesn't sound like they did it. Or <laughs> so I saw that's something. The thing, like with our stand up, I, yeah. other, yes. it's very hard for other people to steal our jokes because they're so specific to our very experience. Very personal. But yeah. that's, and, and I think that, that people sometimes look at that and they say, well, oh, you're a foreigner. Of course it's going to be like that. But that's actually just something about good stand up. Mm. If you have a good stand up piece, it's because you as a person really believe that you have something to say here. Mm. And that's going to come across in how you say it. So whenever I hear a joke that it's like, oh, right. like there's an old lady in my building who borrowed a vacuum cleaner. Like uh, that could, even if that's true, it could have been done on the internet with no setup, with no personality from you, and you could put it right on Weibo and people would laugh. If you come up with a joke like that, you kind of owe it to the audience to figure out how to make it so actually genuine. Exactly. But yeah. on the other hand, I want to ask the Dashan Mark here mm -hmm. particularly because people joke about you sometimes or they make yeah. jokes about you because you are an iconic figure in a way uh, the, you know the earliest generation of so-called foreigners coming into China speak perfect Chinese and people look at you as if you are one of us and yet you are so different and all of these things people are comparing every foreigner to Da Shan <laughs> the figure that you created on yeah. the stage you know this is a very controversial two roles you're playing you're yourself a real person but on the other hand you're there's also there's a phenomenon there yeah. exactly and when you reach that stage you have to recognize okay that so, okay, so that's which me. role I'm are that, you but playing? Also there, well, there's the there's a character. The character is pretty much me. The character is more or less me. It's sort of a stage version of myself. But a, apart from the character, there's this phenomenon of this thing, right? And mm. it and it takes on a life of its own. And you have to realize that you don't you that is you, and you are doing that. But you don't necessarily own that phenomenon. People will people will perceive it the way they perceive it. You can't you can't change that. What really is humor these days? How significant is it for our society, whether it's China, Canada, or America? These days, the Daily Show has become almost a news show, in yeah. a way. So humor seems to play on more responsibility than it used to be, which is only about laughter. Mm -hmm. So Mark, what do you think, Dashan? What is humor now, and how much responsibility really you are having on your shoulder? Well, humor is central to the human experience. It's something that separates humans from animals. I mean, we, it's very hard to tell if animals really have a sense of humor, mm. but humans all do, all different cultures. Humor, so humor is something that's central to being human. I so think I, that's why I'm, I'm not doing Western stand-up. I'm doing Dashan style stand-up for China. Jesse? I would say humor is very important, although obviously I, oh, you know, I personally yeah. think that. But I think it's really true. I think that the world is interacting in so many ways that it just didn't even 20, 30 years ago. And as we get better at interacting in business and in different areas of culture, in like in movies, mm -hmm. we also need to bring the humor 
up and help to just have a couple people that are interested in looking at other cultures and their comedy and their and laughing together. Time is really running <laughs> up, and we need to have a laugh probably after this. All uh, right. Maybe a cup of uh, uh, drink with you guys. But uh, for now, I want to wish all of you a happy new year. Uh, happy new year, the happy sheep, new year. the sheep year of the sheep. Ram. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, <laughs> and they say laughter is an instant vacation. I hope our special program today has led you to the beginning of a wonderful vacation celebrating the Lunar Chinese New Year. On behalf of the World Inside team, I would like to wish you a happy new year and many laughs in the 12 months ahead. I'm Dian Wei in Beijing. Good night and happy new year. Thank you so much. Thank you.